Alan Moser, the fall of the Buffalo Mob. Uh, my name is Alan Moser. I am very proud to be Greg's partner. Uh, I'm in the Buffalo office mostly, but I come down to Chicago whenever I can to practice before great judges like Judge Cass, uh, who I see in the audience. Uh, brief background, I grew up in North Buffalo. I was a, uh, I, I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood that then morphed into an Italian neighborhood. Knew very little about uh, ethnicities as a result because they would go out Wednesday afternoons and we would have uh, class off as they did their religious instruction. I, I can tell you that I, I married my wife, uh, Paula, because I was passing through Palermo and visiting my brother who was going to medical school there. Paula was born and raised in Palermo. Her uh, mother comes from Campobello di Licata, which is down toward the south of the island. And my father-in-law came from the Palermo area itself. I, I can tell you a quick story that my, grand, my uh, daughter was in school one day, and the teacher said, did any of you have relatives who fought in the Second World War? And my daughter raised her hand like so. Yes, I did. And the teacher said, oh, please tell us about it. And she said, well, he fought in Italy for Mussolini against those <laughs> English people. And he did a good job. And, and he survived the war. And the teacher looked dumbfounded and said, thank you. And anybody else? <laughs> and, and that's sort of the background. But uh, my wife uh, is very proud of her Palermo heritage. We, we did the 23andMe DNA testing. She was intent on telling us all that she had Carthaginian blood uh, because she's from Palermo. It turned out that she's 20% Middle Eastern, which is the Punic influence that brought in Carthage, uh, Carthaginians coming to Sicily. She's all Southern European. I, on the other hand, am all Northern European, and I'm proud to say uh, that I'm in the top 4% of Neanderthal blood, and I will not stomach any Neanderthal jokes uh, if, if anybody thinks of one. In any event, my knowledge of, of uh, the Mafia really came in 1972 with, with The Godfather, and in 74, I knew and I appreciated very little uh, about the Mafia because of my upbringing. Um, my upbringing, for example, included my father at the Presbyterian Church wearing tails and spats on his feet, and all eight of them would go up and down the aisle with collections, and it was a real ceremony to see eight men in tails and spats carrying the collection plates up. So that was about as far as you can get from the mob, except for one instance, and that is my father was a cardiologist. And one day, uh, this ties me in at the beginning of this presentation, one day uh, he was appointed by the federal court, or it could have been the state court, but he was happy to tell us that he was appointed, and he remembered that the patient came in to see him. And the patient was preceded by two very bulky, large figures who came in, looked around the waiting room, and then Mr. Magadino came in. And my father had been appointed as a, an impartial physician to give an examination because Magadino was saying he, he could not go to trial because of a heart murmur. My father was very, very nervous. He, he proud of his reputation, and he, he said to himself, well, what if there's not a heart murmur? What, what happens then? Well, luckily, Mr. Magadino came in, sat down uh, with his protection around him, and my father, with his shaky hand, did hear a heart murmur, and Mr. Magadino did not have to go to trial. Uh, but that's about the extent of our uh, acquaintance, though, with that background. Here's a, a picture of, of Sicily. On the left is the sign known as the Trinacria. And if you look at the Trinacria, it sort of resembles in the ancient sense, how Sicily appears geographically. Uh, the Trinacria is on the flag. I have this flag at home. Uh, and Sicily there is on the right. Somebody said, well, can you give a quick 20-second history of Sicily? And it goes like this. Uh, it was originally inhabited by the Sicils. The Greeks arrived on the west coast, where Etna is, as you look on the right-hand side, around the 7th century. The Carthaginians came to the west coast, uh, over on the left-hand side, Around the 6th century, they fought wars in the 4th and 3rd centuries. Ultimately, the Romans arrived on the right side, on the east side of the island. They fought with the Carthaginians and threw them out. The Romans stayed there until the 9th century. Some of you may say, well, didn't Rome fall in the 5th century? Well, it's a long story. It involves Constantinople. That's what I studied at college, and I'm not going to bore you with that. In the 9th century, the Arabs came, and they imposed a Muslim 
uh, administration on the island. And to this day, uh, when I went to a wedding a couple years ago up in the mountains, we asked directions from somebody, and we heard him go inside and to say, there are a couple of Christians outside, Christiani outside, who are looking for directions. And they use that term because it goes all the way back to the Arabs in the 9th and 10th centuries. In the 11th century, in came the Normans. They controlled the island for a couple of centuries. The Normans, of course, are from northern France. They were displaced by the French. Uh, there's the famous story of the Sicilian Vespers uh, that I can't really go into. But they were succeeded then by Germans and ultimately by the Spanish, who morphed into a, a kingdom of two Sicilies, as Judge Martocci mentioned, that lasted up until about 1865, when Garibaldi landed on the west side, uh, that is the left of the island, and with the Mille, the thousand men, they conquered Sicily uh, from the Bourbon kings to reunite Sicily with Italy. So that's your 22nd background into, into Sicilian history. One of the things to consider uh, is that Sicily was under central control at all times. Unlike the rest of Western Europe, which had the rise of feudalism and mercantilism, the, the kingdom of Sicily and two Sicilies were always under central control. They had taxation instead of feudalism. Because of that, there arose decades, generations and generations of corruption uh, and that sort of thing, which ultimately gave rise to the Mafia. One thing to consider is that the elites of Sicily always lived on the littoral, that is on the beach areas all the way around Palermo, Catania, Messina, Syracusa, Trapani. This is where the elites lived. The farming was going on in the middle of Sicily. Who was in the middle of Sicily were their overseers. And you, you will see uh, photos from time to time from the 19th century of the overseers with their, their shotguns across their, their lap. And it was because of the water shortages that these things had to be sorted out. As time went on, the mafia developed out of the water shortage area, as well as protection against the, the government whenever they got a little bit too, too uh, uppity in demanding things. I'm going to take you now to 1900. It was mentioned earlier that there was a wave of Sicilians and, and Italians who came to America about this time. In the 1890s, the New York City Police Department was run by the Irish. That'll come as, as no surprise to a lot of people. But in came all of these Sicilians and Italians. They, they spoke dialect. They spoke their own language. They didn't really interact. And it turned out that the Irish police force wasn't particularly interested in what was going on in the Sicilian and Italian areas of New York City. As a result, there was a lot of crime. There was a lot of kidnapping. There was a lot of extortion, the protection rackets, and nobody was doing anything about it because there was just no interest in it. it they were left to their own. Joe Petrosino on the left-hand side was the first Italian-American uh, policeman who rose to any prominence, prominence in New York City. He himself was responsible for going into these areas of Italian and Sicilian pockets and, and, and doing what law and order expects, dealing out arrests, bringing people in, uh, and he became quite a hero. As a result, they then instituted the Italian American Bureau of the New York Police Department, which then really cracked down on the kidnappings, on the protection, and brought some sense back to things. At this time, crime was becoming organized and became organized as the Black Hand, as you may have heard uh, uh, before. And the Black Hand was an organized group uh, where of loosely organized, uh, to carry out these kidnappings and to keep things going on, Petrosino took on the black hand himself with his Italian-American force and, and did a lot of good. On the right-hand side, you can see Petrosino on the left taking uh, one of the black hand. The second one from the right is a black hand who had been arrested, and they're, they're taking him to court. He did, he did a lot of good. He also recognized that many of the Sicilians and Italians who were coming over were criminals. And the immigration laws at that time, much like today, said that if you're a criminal, you cannot immigrate into America, you would be turned back. Unfortunately, papers were lacking. So at one point, uh, Joe Petrosino, after getting control of the Italian Sicilian area, uh, area uh, went, decided he had to go to Italy to see what was going on and to track down the paperwork necessary to send many of these people back to Italy and Sicily where they came from. 
In the meantime, however, he did track down a number of them, sent them back, and that's going to be the subject of a story later in my presentation. Mussolini and Giuseppe Mori are two people who arrived in the 1920s. As I just mentioned, Petrosino was responsible for sending back a number of black hand people to Sicily. Those people took with them the ideas of organization that were being developed in America. So you had this cross-fertilization. Mussolini uh, came to power in the early 1920s. One time he visited Sicily and went to the village of Corleone. In Corleone, the mafia had pushed out the socialist mayor and installed their own. He was a man uh, familiarly known as Don Ciccio. Mussolini came down and he had his bodyguard with him, to which Don Ciccio said to Mussolini, why are you worried about that? I'm in control here. And Mussolini looked around and figured out that was true. So he appointed Giuseppe Mori to come in as the prefect in the 1920s, and Mori began rounding people up. He did a lot of investigations, created a lot of paperwork, uh, but he would arrest 100 people at a time and put them behind bars. Uh, he was told by Mussolini, look, if the laws are impeding you in any way, let me know. We'll just make new laws. And so they were able to clean up the mafia, and the jails of Sicily were overflowing with mafiosi as a result of uh, Mori, who came to be known as the Iron Prefect. This is going to come into play a little bit uh, later. I can tell you this. The Americans invaded Sicily in 1943. They stepped off at Licata and the southern coast. They took over the island, but they weren't prepared really to administer the island. So what did they do? They went and looked for Mussolini's political enemies who happened to be in jails. Who was in the jails? It was the mafiosi. The Americans, believe it or not, loosed all of these mafiosi out to become their administrators, and the mafia experienced a sudden resurgence in taking control of the island. After the war, there was nostalgia in Sicily for fascism because of what Mussolini and Mori had done. That explains that. The Sicilians really, at the heart of it, don't appreciate the mafia and the control. And what is the control? It's over the things that uh, was gone over earlier. It's, it's prostitution, it's gambling, the numbers, all of these things the Mafia has its hands in, but also in protection. Protection from the police and mostly protection from the Mafia. And this explains uh, a lot of things. For example, the, the idea was, and what Maury said was, look, to eliminate the Mafia, we need to give people direct access to the government. And that is, you don't get a recommendation, you don't get somebody to help you to get that permit, you don't get somebody to help you to get justice, you have to be able to go directly to the government. And that's what Maury did as the Iron Prefect in, in uh, taking care of things. All right, fast forward. I first got to Sicily in uh, 1977. Uh, and in 78, I spent several months there, When I and 79 as well, when I uh, approached my father-in-law about marrying his daughter. Uh, he said two conditions. Number one, you need to, to learn Italian, and that was fine with me. And the second was, you need to take her cat with you. Uh, the cat survived a couple of days in America, and we've had wedded bliss ever since. But I began reading something called the Giornale di Sicilia, the Sicilian newspapers is what it is. And the Giornale di Sicilia is uh, a, a paper which, like the television stations in, in Sicily, are not reluctant to show gruesome photos of deaths of people involved with the Mafia. In, in Italy, they call it omicidi eccellenti, which is loosely translated as excellent homicides. Uh, Boris Giuliano, though, I, I remember in 78 and 79, when I spent uh, many months in, in Palermo, was the leader of the Squadra Mobile. They were the strike force uh, for, the, for the government, and he investigated crimes uh, on a regular basis, and his photo was in the paper. On the left-hand side, you can see Boris Giuliano investigating a mafia murder. This was published in the paper. Uh, on the right-hand side, it turned out on July 21, 1979, while, while I was in Palermo, he, was, he went to the bar in the morning. Bars in Italy are where you get coffee and pastries to start your day. He was sipping his cup of coffee when a mafioso came up behind him, 
put the gun to his head, and that was the end of Boris Giuliano. There was, there was despair in, in Palermo at that time because Giuliano was looked upon as a fresh face possibly doing something. In 1979, on the right-hand side, Magistrate Terranova, equivalent to the United States Magistrate, was uh, assassinated in Palermo. So that at this point, the mafia was beginning to make itself felt and was taking on the government in a frontal assault. Uh, Magistrate Terranova, like the United States Magistrate, 1980, Pierasanti Mattarella, he was president of the Sicily region. This would be like killing the governor of the state of New York. On the left-hand side, Pio Latore, he was the Communist Party chief. They killed him in 1982. Uh, it was just a slaughter that was going on. Uh, if you read the books of, of a fellow named Leonardo Shasha, he, he explains how the, how the mafia gets involved in what is going on in life. And they don't stop with prostitution, extortion, protection, but they also get themselves involved with the government. And so this assault on the government really was a result of, of things going on in the government that the mafia did not appreciate. Generale Carlo Alberto Dalla Chiesa. He was the, one of the chiefs of the federal police. This is essentially the FBI you could, you could equate it to. We don't have a, a national police force. He was in charge. He was fresh off of taking care of the Brigati Rossi, the Red Brigades that you may recall. He was a very famed person. Uh, he was sent down to Sicily. And what happened many times over the years would be northerners would be sent to Sicily. They don't speak the language. They're a little bit isolated. Dalla Chiesa really tried to get himself involved. He worked very hard at it. And unfortunately, both he and his wife were assassinated in Palermo in 1982. This created a real stir because now the chief of the federal police had been assassinated in Palermo. Uh, a piazza was, was named after him. I, I drive by this spot all the time. The mafia, though, was involved in the halls of power. On the left-hand side, you'll see Giuseppe, uh, Giuliano Andreotti with Berlusconi. So those of you who remember Andreotti, he became premier of Italy off and on over many, many years. As a matter of fact, it was a common misconception. Those of you old enough will remember that the Italian government was constantly falling. It was like musical chairs. The secret was this, however. The undersecretaries were always of the same party, the Democrat Christians. So that while the musical chairs were going on, there was corruption that had been set in because the administration never changed. Unlike Democrats and Republicans, where we change everybody up to a certain point going down, in Italy, for, for a score of years, the government was always the same. Andreotti was supposed at one point to have met with a fellow named Toto Riina. And on the right-hand side, you'll see two men kissing, generally a sign of, of respect and familiarity. Uh, but it, there was a trial in which Andreotti was accused of having consorted with Totorino, who was the boss of bosses in Sicily. And there was a famous story of a kiss that they exchanged at one point, showing how the mafia and the government had, had been uh, wed together. Judge Martucci earlier mentioned some of the crusading uh, judges who, who knew that they were in, in trouble when they took it on. Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellino were investigating judges. In Italy, as in the continental system, rather than grand juries going forward, you have investigating judges who do their investigations and then lay charges themselves. Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellini, uh, Borsellino were two of these. They were crusading people. They really came in and were effective in the wake of the death of General Dalla Chiesa. Uh, as a result of that, there were many investigations going on, and it began to be developed the concept of the penitenti, uh, the repentant people, and that is mafioso soldiers who turned and, and renounced omerta uh, because otherwise they were looking at life sentences, they quickly found it in their favor to begin ratting out. And so you had the phenomenon of the penitenti started in the late 80s and early 90s, which aided the investigating judges in doing what they did. Unfortunately, both of them knew what they were up against. Uh, on the left-hand side uh, is a monument. On the right-hand side uh, is uh, the death of Borsellino. With Falcone, he was driving along this autostrada that you see here. 
That Brown Monument is over a viaduct. The Mafia stoked up the viaduct with explosives. And as Falcone was coming in from the airport with his escort, they blew up the entire roadway. Killed many people. They were looking to get Falcone. He did not survive the explosion. A monument is, is there, and we drive by it every time we go to Palermo. Borsellino was coming out of a house with his family. A car was packed with explosives. If, if you drive around Sicily, even now, you will find magistrates who have police guards around their house and nobody can get in unless they're passed through. Somehow, somebody parked a vehicle. Corruption was obviously present. And as Borsellino came out of his home, he was blown up. These were two great crusading judges, anti-mafia judges, both of whom were killed by the mafia. So what happened? Uh, just as Elliot Ness and, and others went after Al Capone on the paper, the Guardia di Finanza, the financial, National Financial Police, came into play and started looking at things. And what they did was, if, you, if, I, if I go into the bar in the morning to get my, my coffee and, and Cornetto, when I come out, I have to carry my receipt with me because of the money laundering that had been going on. And so the police and, and the government in cracking down figured out the way to get to these guys is to go after the money, as somebody said earlier. Follow the money. So every time you go into a bar, a restaurant, anywhere else, you must bring the receipt out with you. If you don't have it and a Guardia Finanza is there and, and uh, you don't produce it to them, you're arrested and taken in. Uh, not heavy penalties, of course, but enough to make people do it. What happened as a result of all this, uh, for example, was that 40% of the shops in Palermo closed down. So an interesting little idea, down the street on Viale Lazio from where my, my wife's house is, I walked down to a Photoshop to get Kodachrome about 20 years ago, uh, late 90s, and there was a sh I knew there was a shop there, I went by it all the time. I went in, and unlike most Italian shops, it had just like one canister of film here and a camera over here, something else up here, whereas most Italian shops are just full, bountiful, plenty of stuff as you look around, you think you're in a rich place. But I walked in, I said, I need some Kodachrome. And the gentleman behind the counter said, we don't have any. And I said, but this is a photo shop, do you have any film? He said, no, we have no film. And I said, well, uh, do you know where I can get it? And he said, no, I don't know. So I left befuddled. Sure enough, the next year when I went back, it wasn't there anymore. It was closed down. Uh, one of the many shops that uh, the Guardia di Finanza went after. This is Totorina. Ucapu di Icapi. That's Sicilian, so I don't say it very well. But, it's, but it means the, the chief of chiefs, the, the boss of bosses uh, of all of Sicily. He was on the run for a good 15 years. Everybody knew his name. He was driving around in the countryside, protected by others uh, who knew him. In any event, they finally caught up with him. He was a man of respect, uh, but later known to be a beast, La Belva, because of his involvement. It turns out that it was Riina who ordered the executions of those magistrates and of Generale Dalla Chiesa. This was testified to, and he received the uh, life sentence as a result. Shipped out to an island somewhere, hopefully forgotten, but never really. I, I think it was Judge Martucci or, or Mr. Capolo who referenced earlier the pizza connection. The pizza connection was one of many, many crimes, as well as the execution of the general, that came up at something called the Maxi Processo, in the mid-1990s. This was after Borsellino and Falcone had been killed. But you can see the galleries uh, behind the rows of seats, all of them filled with uh, people who, who were under accusation. Uh, plenty of uh, relatives were also there. It was like a theater event. Uh, there were about 170 people who were all convicted as a result of this maxi processo, including uh, the Pizza Connection. So I started off with uh, Joe Petrosino, uh, and before I go on to this, just let me say this. The, the question was also posed, what happened to the Mafia? Well, the Mafia in, in Sicily learned a lesson. When they took on the government, it did take a while for the government really to ramp up, but ultimately the government did put a lot of people in prison and do their best to stamp down on it. We don't read so much of uh, magistrates being murdered anymore. Uh, we don't read of, of, uh, of the uh, excellent homicides uh, on the streets anymore or see them in the, 
the television, they, they've gone a little more quiet. Uh, I can only imagine what would have happened in America if they had taken out a, a judge or, or a police chief or an FBI head. Uh, you, can, you can imagine what the crackdown would be. So they've, they've gone a little bit into hiding. What we're looking at right now brings us back to the beginning. Joe Petrosino, as I told you, went overseas to try and figure out the criminal records of people coming to America. And he did a pretty good job of, of, of finding a lot of records in the, Palermo, in, in the Palermo files and elsewhere. The police chief in Palermo knew that he was there and was very, very careful to, to assign him bodyguards at all times because he knew that Petrosino had sent back some of those mafiosi, if you'll recall, to Italy, who were looking for him, who had heard he would be there. Well, one day, the Piazza Marina, which is also called Piazza Garibaldi, which is in downtown Palermo, one day, Joe Petrosino had been in Palermo for a few days, did not have his police guard, and he walked out to the garden to meet somebody. Uh, it is a beautiful garden. I first heard the story that some policeman from New York showed up naively trying to figure out uh, what was going on with the Black Hand in Palermo. In fact, Petrosino was there on a mission. Two men met him at, at the gate, and at that time, they began talking. There were two women walking nearby. Uh, all of a sudden, one of them raised a pistol. Petrosino pushed it out of the way, but the other man also had a pistol, and they shot Petrosino dead here at the Piazza Marina in Palermo. The two women were quickly interviewed by some other bystanders about what had happened, what had happened. They immediately recalled what had happened, but a few minutes later, they no longer recalled what had happened. So how does that get me back to Niagara Falls? Because Greg told me I have to get back to Niagara Falls. President McKinley was at the Pan Am in Buffalo. Petrosino, in his researches, had, had uh, developed quite a few confidential sources of information in Europe. He heard from his sources in Europe and in Italy that anarchists in America were going to go after uh, President McKinley. He passed this information on. It's a matter of public record. He passed the information on and said, McKinley is going to be a target. you got to be careful. McKinley came to, to the Pan Am in Buffalo. He then went up to Niagara Falls. Uh, I think it was September 5. He went up to Niagara Falls, saw the falls. Here he is uh, walking up uh, to the uh, promontory. And then the next day, although Petrosino had warned up against it, Zoldos uh, got to President McKinley. So Greg, I got you back to Niagara Falls. This was a short history. I, as you can imagine, I could talk for a very long time about all of this. Uh, this is a quick film. When Dalla Chiesa uh, died, there was, there was great mourning all over Sicily, and a, a movie was made. It's called Cento Giorni di, di Palermo. Cento Giorni a Palermo. 100 Days of Palermo. This is the film showing Della Chiesa with his, with his young wife. Scusa, abbiamo un video sul serio? Vuol dire che per il corretto, per il presto, da te un su una bocca di testa, per tutti i chat, quando è successo, che è successo, ma quando è vero, lo chiedo che era successo, tutto è stato, e non è stato, 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 non è Tutti che ne si perdono tante carne, picchiano presto un lanzolo bianco o un micchiano, e un lanzolo di un tor rosso di lotano. What you're hearing is an elegy to, to uh, General Dalla Chiesa. Uh, his death was a death of martyrdom, and that is a Sicilian elegy to him about the poor citizens of Palermo. When will we get any relief? Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your time. That's worth a bill of hour, Alan. <laughs>